Hello. I hope you can hear me. And if not, well. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> we shall see. Let's fares. Good evening to you, one and all. <laughs> there is only, we're not going to start right away. We're going to wait a little bit uh, and see how many people join because you don't want to start in the middle of the story, right? No. You want to come into it at the right time, preferably the beginning. Now we're... I'm just setting up my lights, trying to make it a little bit more comfy, not so incredibly white light, because that hurts the eyes. And yes, there is a Christmas light here. There is a Christmas light. And you can sort of see the words Timas up there. Now, this is a purely technical limitation due to things. But don't worry about don't worry about that. Or don't worry about how, about how it looks. The actual uh, author, my face in this case, is not that important, really. And would you believe I have not actually read this book? I probably have read read it once or twice, but in recent memory, I have I have no memory of reading it. And <clears throat> and so I thought I'd give it a go. And uh, what what better way than to motivate myself to read it by reading it aloud. And it's going to take a little while, but I think that's okay. We'll give it until 13 minutes past six, and then I'll start. Start the read. So if you want to go get something and uh, sit back, and I'm hopefully my voice is being picked up okay by the microphone. I have never used this before to stream to Facebook, but it should be fine. So, I'm going to do that. I'm also going to get a charger cable, uh, but we'll be right back. Or I'll be right back. You guys can you know, stay here, if you like, uh, until the time is 13 past. And then we'll go. Right? And here we are. Hello. Hello and welcome back. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a British accent, so I can't write, read this book to you in a, you know, really honest Dickensian sort of way. But you're going to have to live with a slightly American accent, and that's hopefully fine. <laughs> And if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm getting a charging cable for my Kindle. And there we go. And hopefully getting rid of some horrible, horrible getting rid of some screen brightness. 
just waiting for the camera to understand that I'm sitting in front of it. Thank you. That's much better. Okay. Are you guys ready? Now this is a pretty this is kind of long so we're not going to read the entire thing today. We're going to I'm going to try and get through stave 1 or chapter 1 Marley's ghost. And here we go. <clears throat> a Christmas carol in prose being a ghost story of Christmas by Charles Dickens. Stave one, Marley's ghost. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatsoever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he put his hand to. Yes, old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Now, mind you, I don't mean to say that I know of my own knowledge. What there is that is particularly dead about a doornail? I might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade. But the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and in my unhallowed hands it shall not be disturbed. You will therefore permit me to repeat with em emphasis that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Did Scrooge know he was dead? Well, of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend, and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut, cut up by that sad event but that he had an excellent man of business on the very day of the funeral and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am going to relate to you. If we were not perfectly convinced that Hamlet's father died before the play began, there would be nothing more remarkable in his taking taking sorry pardon me there would be nothing more remarkable in his taking a stroll at night in the easterly wind upon his own ramparts than there would be in an, any other middle-aged gentleman rashly turning out after dark in a breezy spot say st paul's cathedral for instance literally to astonish his son's weak mind scrooge never painted out old marley's name there it stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained, and as solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheeks, stiffened his gait, and made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty grime was on his head and on his eyebrows and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature about him always. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, no wintry weather chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. No falling snow was more intent upon its purpose no pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect. 
They often came down handsomely, and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was a clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind man's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming on, would tug their owners into the doorways and up courts, and then would wag their tails as though they said, No eye at all is better than an evil eye, dark master. Eh, but what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance, was what the knowing ones called nuts to Scrooge. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy withal, and he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. It had not been light all day, and candles were flaring in the windows of the neighboring offices like ruddy smears upon the palpable brown air. The fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole, and was so dense without that, although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. To see the dingy cloud come drooping down, obscuring everything, one might have thought that, na that nature lived hard by and was brewing on a large scale. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, so that he might keep an eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, if you will, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one of coal. It looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in, in his own, own room, and so surely as the clerk came in with a shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore, the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Bah! said Scrooge. Humbug! He had so heated himself with rapid walking in the fog and frost, this nephew of Scrooge's, that, is what, that he was all in a glow. His voice was, face was ruddy and handsome, his eyes sparkled, and his breath smoked again. "'Christmas a humbug, Uncle,' said Scrooge's nephew. "'You don't mean that, I am sure.' But, I, "'I do,' said Scrooge. "'Merry Christmas! What right do you have to be merry?' What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then, returned the nephew gaily. What right do you have to be so dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Scrooge, having no better answer ready on the spur of the moment, said, Bah! again, and followed it up with another humbug. Oh, don't be cross, uncle, said the nephew. A Merry Christmas, uncle. God save you, cried a cheerful voice. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. Hmm. I think there's been a mishap in editing in this book. What else can I be, returned the Uncle, when I live in such a world of fools as, as this? Merry Christmas! Out upon a Merry Christmas! What's Christmas time to you but time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? A time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a round dozen of months presented dead against you. If I could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, pleaded the nephew. 
Nephew, returned the uncle sternly. Keep Christmas on your own way and let me keep it, keep it in mine. Keep it, repeated Scrooge's nephew. But you don't keep it. Well, leave me alone then, said Scrooge. Much good it may do you. Much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I may have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, returned the young nephew. Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time when it has come around, apart from the veneration due to its sacred name and origin, if anything belonging to it can be apart from that, that is, as a good time, a kind of forgiving and charitable, charitable pleasant time, the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year, when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they were really fellow passengers to fellow fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me some good, and I say God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Becoming immediate, immediately, immediately sensible of the impropriety, he poked the fire and extinguished the last frail spark forever. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would, he would see him. Yes, indeed he did. He went the whole length of the, of the expression, and he said that he would see him in that extremity first. But why, cried Scrooge's nephew, why? Why did you get married, said Scrooge? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if that were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Nay, uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I'm sorry with all my heart to find you such, find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party, but I have made the trial an homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge, and a Happy New Year. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. His nephew left the room without an angry word, not with, notwithstanding. He stopped at the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. There's another fellow, muttered Scrooge, who overheard him. My clerk, with fifteen shillings a week and a wife and family, talking about a merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam. <clears throat> this lunatic, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood, with their hats off, in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands, and they bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Oh, Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago this very night. We have no doubt his libera liberality is well represented by his sur surviving partner, said the gentleman, presenting his credentials. It certainly was, for they had been two kindred spirits. At the ominous word liberality, Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. 
Many thousands are in want of common necess necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? asked Scrooge. Plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down the pet again. And the union workhouses, demanded Scrooge. Are they still in operation? They are, still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor, then, said Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid, from what you had said at first, that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course, said Scrooge. I am very glad to hear it. Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, returned the gentleman, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We chose this time because it is a time, of all others, when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing, Scrooge replied. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Sure I understand. <laughs> Siri is talking to me for some reason. Sorry. I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many who can't go there, or, and many would rather die. Well, if they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know that. But you, but you might know it, observed the gentleman. It is not my business, Scrooge returned. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hmm. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labors with an improved opinion of himself and in a more facetious temper than was usual of him. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses and carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church, whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the wall, became invisible and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds, with tremulous vibrations afterwards, as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there. The cold became intense, and in the main street, at the corner of the court, some laborers were repairing the gas pipes and had lighted a great fire in a brazier, round which a party of ragged men and boys were gathering, warming their hands and winking their eyes before the blaze in rapture. The water plugs being left in solitude, its overflowing suddenly congealed and turned to misanthropic ice. The brightness of the shops where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows, made f pale faces ruddy as they passed. Poulterers and grocers' trades became a splendid joke, a glorious pa pageant with which it was next to impossible to believe that su such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor, in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house, gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as the Lord Mayor's household should, and even the little tailor, whom he, had, whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his garret, while his lean wife and the baby sallied out to buy the beef. And that is up to page, let me see. Hang on a moment. It is to page 
Well, this is an ebook. It doesn't have pages that way. Uh, it's 12% into the book, and I think we'll take a break there and continue reading tomorrow. I hope you liked it. I'm just going to see how many more pages is in the actual chapter before I go on. It's not that incredibly a long book. I could actually read a few, a few more pages. Hmm. Yes. I'll read a few more pages. Hang on. Foggier yet and colder, piercing, searching, biting cold. If the good St. Dunstan had but nipped the evil spirit's nose with a touch of such weather as that, instead of using his familiar weapons, then indeed he would have roared to lusty purpose. The owner of one scant young nose, gnawed and mumbled by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down to Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol, but at the first sound of, God bless ye, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay, Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more congenial frost. Scrooge seized the... Uh, uh, sorry. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. And with an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted to the fact admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who insistently instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all tomorrow, I suppose, says Scrooge, if quite convenient, sir. It is not convenient, said Scrooge, and it's not fair. If I was to stop a half crown for you, you'd think yourself ill used, I'll be bound. The clerk smiled faintly. And yet, you don't think me ill use when I pay Jay's wages for no work. The clerk observed that it was only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December, said Scrooge, buttoning his great coat to the chin. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no greatcoat, went down a slide on Cornhill at the end of a lane of boys, twenty times in honor of it being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Bluff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's books, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged, belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in the lowering pile of building up a yard where it had, it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house, playing it at hide-and-seek with other houses, and have forgotten the way out again. It was old enough now, and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but, Scro but Scrooge, the other rooms being all let out as offices. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, was fain to grope with his hands. The fog and the frost so hung about the black old gateway of the house that it seemed as if the genius of weather sat in mournful meditation on its thres threshold. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all peculiar about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it, night and morning, during his whole residence in that place. And also that Scrooge had as little of what, what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London, even including, which is a bold word, the corporation, aldermen, and livery. Let, is also, let it also be borne 
Born in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since his last mention of his seven years dead partner that afternoon. And then let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. All right. And there we will stop for tonight and continue next time. Thank you for watching. Good night.